it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, and this is where I think Advent gets tough, because we struggle today to still be preparing, because we just want to have it be Christmas Sunday and start the celebration. But there is this one last Sunday of preparation. There was one last candle to light. Today we lit the last purple candle, the angel's candle, and we remember the angel's announcement of the peace that Jesus came to bring peace from God, peace with God, peace in our hearts in a time where we really need it the most. Richard Foster wrote years ago in his classic book, Celebration of Discipline, using his words, fasting reveals the things that control us. In my words, I've always chosen to put it, fasting shows you what owns you. I mean, if we think about it, You know, we don't really have to think that much about food. You eat what you want for most of us, kind of when we want. But then if we have a situation where we go 24 hours without food, suddenly we will find out how important food is to us. I always like the old Warner Brothers cartoons when you got a couple of hungry guys stranded somewhere and they start looking at each other and hallucinating each that the other is food. You know, not many of us still practice fasting as a spiritual discipline these days, except maybe some in some way during Lent. But maybe we can just think about some time when we had to go without food for 12 hours because of some medical thing that we had to do. Um, Or if we had to make major changes in our diet for some medical reason, or suddenly in a situation like that where we had to give up something that we have loved for a very long time, but suddenly for medical reasons, it just has to be gone and and we can know what a struggle that can be. And we also know how good something can look when suddenly you just cannot have it. I think this year has raised the idea of fasting to a whole new level for many of us, but not in the area of food. If giving something up makes you aware of how much control it has over you, We have gone through that on a grand scale this year because so much of what we normally do in our lives just wasn't possible anymore. And it wasn't just about the idea of control or feeling like we had lost control of some things. I think there were a lot of other feelings we were having. We began to struggle at different times in this year with depression, loneliness, discouragement, frustration, maybe we realized that there are a lot of things that we manage to avoid emotionally, normally, just because we're so busy and we're always in motion, but suddenly those things were right there in our face. Struggles became harder to ignore. Our frailty, our humanness became too real to deny. How many of us were not happy to find out that it was really that easy for us to be affected by feelings of anxiety and discouragement. How many of us just thought we were tougher than that? And how many of us felt some things this year that we couldn't even work out how to put them into words? And in the midst of all of that, maybe the blessing is that all of that together makes us aware of our need for God. I mean, we need a Savior. Jesus is not just a take it or leave it option for us. We need him in our lives. And sometimes we avoid that truth through busyness until life finds a way to confront us with our own frailty. I think we expect to go through something like that when we find out maybe that we have some horrible health problem or we go through a tragic experience or a loss. But this year, we found out that just disruption of the routine And facing uncertainty on a daily basis could rock us to the core. It makes us understand that we need the Christmas gift. We need Jesus because he's the gift. And I want to read from Luke's gospel, the first chapter, just verses 26 through 38. And it's really the announcement of the gift. And here's how Luke tells it. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. 
The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, For since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your Elizabeth, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. You know, Mary wasn't rich or power, powerful or famous. She didn't live in a big, noteworthy place. This young lady was in a remote village outside the mainstream religious stuff in Jerusalem. And when she is addressed as favored one and told the Lord is with her, we can kind of understand her confusion. How many of us would think, you know, I'm not the kind of person who gets the big opportunity. I'm not the person who wins contests. Stuff doesn't happen to me. But here we're shown God can move anywhere and God can use anyone. And that's good news in and of itself. She is told that she will experience the impossible. And of course she doesn't understand. She is told the Holy Spirit will do it. That she will, as a virgin, bear the Son of God. Because God is on the move. And it's already happening. Her cousin is the example that God is in motion. Her cousin is far beyond childbearing age, and she's already six months pregnant. God is moving, and nothing is impossible with God because he's already gone from the impossible with Mary's cousin to the even more impossible that he's going to do with Mary. And Mary knows this will not be easy. The moral expectations of her community were not loose. Unmarried and pregnant was not popular. Society would make her an outcast. Part of the purpose of the engagement year she was going through was to demonstrate the purity of the bride. This would look like her failure. Her betrothed fiancé would want to divorce her. And still she moves quickly from questions to obedience and says, I am the servant of the Lord. And says, let it be to her according to the angel's word. I think we can understand the questioning Mary. God calls us to do something, and we say, I don't have the resources. I am not in the right place for that. I am like a virgin called to have a baby. I'm like a young woman in a culture that values mainly men and adulthood. I am not what is followed or appreciated. And like Mary, we just would want to be tempted to say, God, I'm sure you can find someone more qualified. And then, just like for her, the Holy Spirit is given to do and to make possible what we cannot do and which would never be possible for us. And it's a gift. It's all a gift. God's favor, God's grace, but it's God's purpose and God's spirit, and it's all a gift. Maybe the special thing this year is how very aware we are of our need for the gift of God, for Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Fasting is about giving things up, but it's also about feasting on more of God. And that's surely what we have needed this year, in this time. And maybe part of the gift of this Christmas is knowing at our core how much we need Christ. The old song we need a little Christmas doesn't apply. We need a lot of Christmas this year. And Christmas, literally two words pushed together, it's the Christ Mass, the communion that remembers on the day we celebrate Jesus' birth that this gift 
is the gift of our Lord who loves us, who died for us, and by his blood makes us clean, and by his resurrected life makes us whole. We need to experience that deeply this year. In Luke chapter 1, verse 47 through 55, just a little bit longer, or a little bit later in the chapter than where we were reading, we're told that Mary sang a song of praise for what God had done for her. In verse 53, she sings, He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. And Mary's song is really a powerful song of faith because it sings of future things in the past tense. And it's really, wow, what a powerful demonstration of faith when you can say that God has done what he will do. You know, it's certainly believing beyond what we can see. But I read that verse and wonder maybe if the tendency to see it in a punishment kind of way is a mistake. What if it's about getting what we really need? What if the hungry will need to experience God's grace to find their needs met by his ability to provide? But what if the rich need to let go and find themselves with less so that they can discover his presence too? And what if the work of God in Jesus is hope for everyone and his grace will work to meet each of us where we are so that in him we will find what we need. And then maybe, what if this year, this exhausting, seemingly never-ending year has shown us that what we really need is more of what God offers himself to fill us where we need filling and to empty us where we need emptying. And in so doing, to bring us to where we can proclaim with Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This last Sunday of approach, of Advent, let's ask Jesus to give us what we need this Christmas, whether it is his provision, his gift of courage and patience and strength, or even if it's his taking some things away and giving us new freedom. Or maybe... If you've never felt a personal need for Jesus, maybe always resisted a personal commitment to Jesus, maybe this is the year to ask him into your heart for the first time. Because maybe this is the year that shows you that you do need him. And if you seek him, ask his forgiveness, ask his grace to come into your heart and life, you will find the real Christmas present, the gift of Jesus. The gift has already been given. We just may need to work on our plan of acceptance. Would you pray with me? God, we know you are the God who can give us what we really need. And in this long year, we felt a lot of things, gone through a lot of things. We've asked a lot of questions. But our hope right now in this moment is that more than anything else, it's made us aware of how much we need you. We rely on you. We depend upon you. And this Christmas, we need even more of you. You are the gift, God. Your son brings us life. Give us more of that life. Let our Christmas be Christ-filled to the point of abundance, of overflowing. More Christmas than we've ever known, that we might share it in ways we never have and see just in your spirit, your presence, and your love. We just want to see more than we've seen in the past. More of your grace, more of your love, more of your presence. And if anyone out there is struggling, give them the courage, even if it's the first time ever, just to ask you into their heart and life that they would find their first experience of unwrapping the present and finding Jesus coming alive in them. We will trust you. We will keep loving you. Help us to celebrate you even as we seek more of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May this Christmas bring you the fullest expression of Christ in the truth of the traditional blessing from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And as they would say in England, happy Christmas. I think we need that this year. Just happy Christmas.